So, Anna, welcome to the Korea Society. Thank you for meeting with us. Thank you for having me. Um, interesting film. Iron, lots of irony there. Tell us about the vetting process on how you were able to get into North Korea. Mm. So it took two years to get into North Korea um, and the reason it took that long is I didn't want to go in as most Western journalists do which is as a tourist and then sneaking whatever covert footage you can while you're there. I wanted total permission from the regime. I wanted an access all areas media visa. So I wanted an access all areas visa. I wanted the full permission of the regime. I wanted to be the first Westerner ever to to, to really explore their film industry unfettered. Um, and so it took two years to, to get that. And the reason I wanted that was I wanted to take in a huge camera, lots of lights, I wanted to be totally in the open with them. I wanted, you know, their full cooperation because as a documentary maker, I know that if you want to make a good doco about any subject, you need their participation. You don't mm. want to be sneaking around. So the story I wanted to tell had nothing to do with starvation in the gulags, which uh, is the normal story we hear about North Korea. It was about their filmmakers. Um, anyway, uh, originally I approached many North Korean embassies. There's no North Korean embassy in Australia. Um, so I wrote to Jakarta, I wrote to Beijing, I wrote to every embassy I could track down. I wrote to the top cultural cadres in Pyongyang, whose addresses I was given by the Australian embassy in Seoul. Um, and I approached a man called Alejandro Cayos de Benos. Have you heard of him? He's a self-appointed, uh, self I believe, um, liaison officer between North Korea and, and the West. And he wanted 70,000 euros up front to get me into Pyongyang. And he couldn't even guarantee I'd meet any filmmakers. So I got a lot of no's, you know, they or no reply at all. And finally, um, the way I got in was through this wonderful British filmmaker who also runs a tour company called Corio Tours out of Beijing called Nick Bonner. And Nick Bonner has gained the trust of the regime because he's made three documentaries over the last 20 years as he's been taking tourists into the country, um, which are very objective. So, so they're observational documentaries. Um, they're about non-political subjects. His attempt is to try and educate the world about life for ordinary North Koreans as opposed to, you know, some kind of political standpoint. You know, it was news to me that actually one of North Korea's policies, and if you look at their websites, you can actually see it, is genuine cultural exchange. And so it was on that basis that the regime finally um, gave me a full media visa and I became the only Westerner ever given total access to their film industry. Until then, Shane Smith had gone to a film museum once for Vice Guide to Film North Korean Film Madness, and Al Jazeera had made a half hour doc about um, film students in Pyongyang, but no one had actually been given the access I was given, so I was, I was very lucky. So you did feel completely free to talk to whoever you wanted. I, did you get that type of freedom of access and uh, to information of, of the, qu the kind that you were looking for? Yeah, so I was completely free to talk to whoever I wanted and ask whatever I qu questions I wanted about film in the film industry, all right? So if I'd strayed from that, if I'd suddenly said, okay, now tell me about Yodiok concentration camp, please, I imagine, you know, the shoot would have been over very, very quickly. Um, so the feeling I had was I was there to, to film their filmmakers, I was there to talk cinema, I was there to travel around Pyongyang. Um, I was allowed to film a whole lot of tour guides because I said to them I need to set up Pyongyang as a city. So they let me outside the film industry and they said okay and, and I gave them a list. Um, of the original list I gave them of everything I wanted to film, they delivered 100%. Um, which was amazing to me. And that's because the people that I met were genuinely engaged in my project. They, they were flattered, although they wouldn't, I don't think, say it out loud. But I think they were secretly flattered that a Westerner would be remotely interested in their films because they know that they're seen as backward. I mean, let's face it, their films are still shot on celluloid on 1950s technology and they're a little bit embarrassed about it because as you know the Korean thing and in fact the North, North Asian thing is about saving face. 
Um, so they're very proud and they didn't want to be seen as backward. And yet at the same time, I think it really tickled them that, that a Western, Western director wanted to genuinely ask them about their techniques rather than say, oh, you know, we made Titanic, we're so much better than you. Um, so it's a real, a, a, a really human to human exchange between artists was the feeling that I had. Mm -hmm. Uh, you were able to speak and interview some of Kim Jong Il's favorite composers mm. and directors, mm. and and um, what was that like meeting them? Uh, were they, did they meet your expectations, or mm. did did you were you surprised by them, or what were some revelations for you when you yeah. met with the, yeah. the North Korean? Um, Sure. Um, when, I, when I first set out to make this film, I never imagined in my wildest dreams that I would end up in North Korea. So what I first did was I went to Seoul and I interviewed eight defected North Koreans, um, five or six of whom had been involved in the film industry. So there was an entertainer, there was an actor, there was a director. And so my original plan with this project, it was, much, it was going to be much more of a parody because the defected North Korean filmmakers were incredibly negative about the regime for understandable reasons. Yeah. Um, but when I ended up in North Korea, uh, thanks to Nick Bonner and his North Korean go-between who set up our shoot, uh, I was surprised. I was expecting that the filmmakers that I'd meet, and they did only introduce me to the elite of the elite, so they were all well over 50, you know, they were the leading representatives in each department of filmmaking. So there was the, the top composer, the top actress, the North Korean Meryl Streep, the North Korean Oliver Stone, the North Korean Martin Scorsese, the, the, the top DOP, the top designer. They're all sitting there in this room. And, you know, I was, I was pretty nervous. Um, I didn't know what they'd make of me, this decadent Westerner. Um, and they were pretty stiff and formal. And then one of them cracked a joke. And I think my first surprise was the humor of these people and their warmth. And these were two things I was not expecting when I arrived in Pyongyang. And the joke happened, it was a lost in translation moment, but it really sums up for me um, the dynamic of, 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 of what I went through. So I'm sitting there like, you know, Julie Andrews, and I'm talking very slowly for our North Korean interpreter. And I said at one point to this room of the elite filmmakers, um, and have you heard of climate change? <laughs> and the director with white hair, Pak song Zhu, you know, this lovely, debonair, gracious, sort of grandfatherly man, took a long drag on his cigarette and looked at me and said, we don't live on the moon. <laughs> and that summed it up for me. So, so these people, uh, let me just say, it's a massive caveat. They're living a good life in Pyongyang. They are the, the elite. They're having a good time. They do not represent the majority of North Koreans. I know this, I'm not naive. Um, and as a result, they watch a lot of Western movies that are normally banned. So they have a, a, a good understanding of how they're portrayed. And he was quite right to say, you know, you guys see us as isolated idiots, but we, we do know a little bit about what's happening outside. Mm -hmm. And yet they were very funny people and very generous. And I suppose when you're living in a regime that can send you away for saying the wrong thing, humor is actually a really great way of coping. Mm -hmm. But then again, their humor, to me, it was the same as the South Korean humor. I mean, I find the Koreans in general very warm, direct, funny, honest, people and they were the same to me which makes sense because they've only been divided for 60 years. Right. There's an international report, a UN report out uh, documenting all of the human rights abuses and the violations of North Korea. So when you were there, I mean, I guess how do you reconcile, you know, meeting with these elites and then knowing of the human rights abuses mm. that are also going yeah, so the report that you're talking about, the 2014 United Nations report mm -hmm. into human rights abuses mm -hmm. in North Korea, was actually headed up by a fellow Australian, uh, former Justice Michael Kirby. Okay. Um, I know of it very well, mm -hmm. and I had read um, as much literature as I could get my hands on about human rights abuses in North Korea and the Gulag system. Mm -hmm. 
And um, I agree with the findings of this report. It's not just the case of a particularly brutal regime that happens to be um, you know, unusually repressive in its penal, citizens, uh, its penal system. We're actually talking about a widespread, institutionalized approach that's quite chilling and horrifying to suppressing um, dissent. And, you know, it, 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 it was, uh, as I imagine for most people, devastating and shocking to me to, uh, as I read these horrific stories, to, to understand that, that human beings could be capable of such cruelty. I mean, the stories coming out from the gulags, from uh, defectors, really are on par with the sorts of stuff we, we associate with the Holocaust and the Nazis. However, I'm a filmmaker and I'm not a politician and therefore my mission is not to toe the party line. My mission is to point my camera and share with the world uh, stories about the complexity of things and to, in my own small way, try and illuminate um, new ways of seeing situations. And what struck me about North Korea is that there are only two stories that we ever get in the West, the gulags and the starvation. And the more I read about the UN, the more I realized that in fact, um, what we're talking about is horrific malnutrition rates, one third of the country. What about the other two thirds of the country? What about the other two thirds of the North Korean population? So we're talking 17 million people who are not on that malnutrition list, you know, the, the two thirds, the 17 million people who are admittedly living under a repress, repressive regime, they are not part of the 200,000 in the gulags. They are not in that one third bracket that is really having to eke out, you know, whatever they can to survive. They are, they have enough food and shelter to live comparatively normal lives. What are their stories? Who are they? Do they love their kids? What is a normal day like for them? What do they dream of? Why don't we ever hear about them? You know, they're just shut off from us as we are from them. And that's why I wanted to make this film in a way, because to me, if you, uh, using the prism of cinema, I really wanted to try and understand what, you know, the ordinary North Korean on the street would be thinking about things. You had a premiere last night, and mm. um, you know, if, if you care to share any stories from it, or if you um, wanted to share some comments from how it went. So it was wonderful to premiere it finally in front of an American audience last night at the New York Asian Film Festival at the Lincoln Center, because one of the first thing that a lot of the audience said to me, and many of them were Korean Americans, was thank you for humanizing them. This is the first time we've seen that. And the most moving thing for me was um, a young woman came up to me afterwards with tears in her eyes and said, my grandfather's still in Pyongyang and oh. I haven't seen him, you know, for, for 20 years or so. Yeah. And thank you because this is the first time I've actually had a glimpse of what life might be like for him. Mm -hmm. um, because my film actually shows a whole lot of images from that city, um, including films that you normally don't see. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that made me happy. Well, thank you so much for sharing, and we wish you all the best. Thank you. In uh, going forward with the uh, Aim High in Creation. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Good you. luck with your work as well. Thank you. Thank you.